My name is Alex Nodell and I'm a grad student at the Joukowsky Institute for Archaeology in the Ancient World. Um, I helped to organize this conference along with Sil Fashard, Fotini Kandili, uh, John Cherry and Sue Alcock and it gives us great pleasure to see all of you here this morning. Uh, we're also very happy to have such an exciting lineup of speakers. So I'm just going to say a few words about the uh, sort of scope and ideas behind the conference and then we will get right to it. When we thought of organizing this workshop on the state of the field in archaeology in Greece, we decided that we wanted to consider some of the big questions currently confronting archaeological research in Greece and also discuss some potential ways forward. These are the next directions in the title of this workshop. Greek archaeology has gone, undergone some major changes in the last few decades. Theory, method, and publications have all been advanced considerably through the efforts of Greeks and foreigners alike. But simple questions regarding how and why this has happened are likely to elicit a very wide variety of responses. This workshop doesn't seek to define the field of Greek archaeology or prescribe its future. We do, however, hope to bring together a very diverse group of people with lots of opinions, backgrounds, and ideas. So to that end, we've split the program up into two sessions. In the morning, we have five papers talking about different sort of historical periods dealing with Greek archaeology. Uh, then we'll have a brief coffee break and then a general discussion where we expect everyone from the audience to contribute to themes that were not discussed in papers, other chronological periods that we can't cover, because of course we can't talk about everything. Uh, in the afternoon session, we'll be discussing more thematic issues and it will follow the same format. So after the individual papers, we will hold our questions, move through to the next one, write your questions down, make a note, and then we will uh, discuss all of that afterward. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker for the evening, Professor Brian Burns. Brian is an associate professor of classical studies at Wellesley College, and his research focuses on social organization and interaction in late Bronze Age Greece. His book, Mycenaean Greece, Mediterranean Commerce and the Formation of Identity, came out with Cambridge University Press in 2010, and he's currently the co-director of the Eastern Boeotia Archaeological Project, which myself and several others in this room have participated in, both in the survey capacity and in the excavation capacity that's currently going on. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Brian. Great, thank you, Alex, um, and thank you for the invitation to be here and to start today. Um, it is a real pleasure to share my thoughts. Um, and uh, as Alex just noted, we, I think we all have to be selective and somewhat idiosyncratic. Uh, so I decided I would just own that. And I'm going to talk <laughs> mostly about the, you know, the themes and issues within Bronze Age studies that I work on. Um, and I'm even going to show you uh, Eastern Boeotia and Aleon in part to, uh, to show you how I'm trying to connect uh, research themes to fieldwork and also to build on what Vasilis presented yesterday uh, and sort of give us an opportunity to, to see that region of Greece from a different perspective. Now, uh, I should also say that I'm delighted to be here um, with colleagues from the field, uh, from my days at Michigan and Los Angeles and work in Greece. Um, so it's a very nice group that you all have brought together. Uh, for me, it seems clear that Aegean prehistory is a, a field, a discipline that is critically self-aware, perhaps because we exist at the intersection of a number of larger disciplines. There uh, has always been, I think, and especially in the last couple decades, uh, a real concern about how do we fit in to a larger scene, whether that's Greek archaeology or classical studies or historical studies more generally. So in thinking about today, I, I selected a few recent attempts to synthesize or represent where the field is and where it's going uh, from the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the current one. 
Now, each of these projects, um, books, the, the Heidelberg Symposium will be out as a book probably this current year. Uh, these are three workshops, conferences, and, and publication projects which had very different aims. So the <coughs> review in a of a GM prehistory that Tracy Cullen edited, of course, uh, was a, a bringing together of a series of articles. Uh, Jack is one of the authors who's here today. Uh, that appeared throughout the 90s, trying to present the, the current state of, of Greek Bronze Age, sorry, prehistoric Greek archaeology, really from a sense of what the, the discoveries and the state of, of knowledge was. So it surprised me to look these articles over and to realize how much they really were determined by region, by site, by chronology. Just a, a wonderfully useful catalog of um, where things were in the 1990s especially. Uh, a few years, uh, I guess it was 2005, was the publication of Prehistorians Around the Pond, where again several of us who are here today came together in Ann Arbor to talk more about the field as a discipline uh, and sort of reflect on who are Aegean prehistorians from a professional identity and, and what kind of concerns do they share. And then in 2011, uh, I was pleased to be able to go to the Heidelberg Conference on Minoan archaeology challenges for the 21st century, which was specifically aimed at younger scholars. Uh, so it was PhD students and postdocs who presented um, a lot of theoretically informed work. And I was really impressed with the range of, of questions that they brought. Uh, and, and I'll say a few things about how I think that uh, largely European point of view um, fits and doesn't fit with some uh, American perspectives. On, on the Bronze Age in particular. So I wanted to take the title State of the Field seriously and, and think about the field in terms of field work as well as in terms of research questions and uh, priorities. Several of the authors in the Review of Aegean Prehistory, the Cullen volume, uh, wrote of the 1990s as the age of the rise of surface survey projects. And, and they sort of foretold that there would be this shift in field work uh, due to scholarly approaches and also the financial realities of the time that would bring an end to large-scale excavations <laughs> and see this proliferation of <laughs> regional surface surveys. Um, th those were true forces and indeed uh, survey has continued, but alongside it indeed excavations still continue at a variety of scales. Uh, so last summer, everyone seemed to be just agog that Vance Watrous actually had 90-plus students at Gornia, um, which is more than I can fathom. Um, these kind of shifts in funding, in research questions, uh, shifts in the Greek law for what kind of permits are available for foreign work, what I think these have led to is a proliferation of mostly smaller projects and ones that over time are combining both survey and targeted excavation to ideally answer specific research questions. So less the idea of the project must continue because it always has and more a sort of focused and hopefully not lasting much more than a decade kind of approach to certain areas and certain sites. So uh, Mycenae, and that's hard to see, but that's Schliemann's crew at, around the shaft graves. Uh, compared with the, the Gornia team of over 100. Um, Mycenae has recently been, been the site of three excavation projects, Knossos, two separate surveys. Um, so you can see how even these large sites and the continuing work that's being done there uh, is t at least organized differently with more specific focus. And for the, the vast number of new projects, I think there's an interesting phenomenon that uh, if you're going to start work at a new place, odds are now that that's going to be a synergasia. And because of the structure of permits uh, in Greece divided between three projects that are solely the foreign institution and three which are synergasias, that has an effect on what kind of projects can continue in a way that reinforces the position of those long-standing excavations um, and it puts people who want to start working in new areas in what I think is a good position, but in the position where they need to forge uh, relationships with local scholars, they need to work in a different format. 
Now, thinking about the Heidelberg Conference, where um, there were great presentations by, by new scholars, um, a lot of those theoretically informed explorations were focused on the body in a couple different ways. Um, first of all, sort of the individual in prehistory, but also experiential approaches to space. Uh, and for the most part, they were working with familiar evidence, the kind of thing that's available for writing your dissertation for the most part, um, and bringing new questions to, as I said, familiar sets of data. Uh, when I was there, I presented some work on uh, revivals and reception of the Minoan body. And here's a, a couple of the very famous Klepsidra sort of parade of art that opened the Athens Olympics and the not yet famous uh, production of Mozart's Cretan opera uh, produced by David Packard at the San Jose Opera. And what I love about um, these studies and these performances is that we can bring really creative approaches and even, um, you know, at times, uh, radical recontextualizations uh, to this, this body of material. But we're very fortunate that, for the most part, the, the Bronze Age material is material that is known from where it was found in situ. Even if it's an old and not the most detailed excavation, we still have a remarkable set of context-rich information to work with. The major exception to that, of course, are the Cycladic figurines of the early Bronze Age. But even though these, I think, were, were on the cusp of a, a new approach, uh, thanks to the active field work, not only at Keros, where the fragments uh, assembled as if they were one figure, but of course belonging to, to several different ones uh, in the middle, those were all found in the new Keros project that Colin Renfrew and Michael Boyd are carrying out. Again, small-scale excavation followed by a survey, uh, I think a really sort of comprehensive approach to this fascinating place uh, where these figurines have been deposited in probably a ritual circumstance, much different from the graves that we assume are the source for so many that have ended up in museums across the world. Those objects uh, can now be tied to questions of interaction and identity. So starting with Cyprian Bridbank's work, the last uh, 13 years, we'll say, uh, has seen really, really smart, well-informed, um, analytical work on interaction in the Cyclades. So that Bridbank's proximal point analysis demonstrated uh, the, the propensity of certain places to, to function, to be recognized as central. And of course, uh, Keros is one of those which seems to have functioned not as a, a place of commercial exchange as much as interaction and, and ritual coming together, pilgrimage, if you will. That's been followed by a number of recent uh, considerations of interaction within the Bronze Age Aegean, especially. And this brings up uh, current and much discussed and debated terms like Minoanization, like Mycenaean influence, which have led to reconsiderations not only of the kind of interaction between different regions, but even the, uh, the meaning of those labels, to what extent we should be thinking in terms of ethnicity, uh, or what, to what extent we should just think of material assemblages that bespeak different kinds of identity. Carl Knappett's been working lately on uh, network theory, and uh, those are images on the left from his, his new book, in which he tries to apply models at different scales, uh, thinking about the networks that happen within sites, within regions, and across broader geographies. Uh, and I think he's doing a lot that's quite interesting in terms of looking at not only multiple scales, but, but playing with the, uh, the intensity of interaction. And so the difference between the top version of the Aegean, if you can make out, uh, Creed across the bottom, and some of those central nodes of the Cyclades in the center, reaching out to mainland Greece and Turkey. That's treating every site uh, as a similar value, as opposed to the bottom image, which recognizes uh, the resources available to larger sites and their, uh, their position to participate more broadly in exchange. These networks set up great uh, new ways to think about regions 
that are not predetermined. And I think that's a really important point I want to emphasize. Uh, as we assess local and regional identity, how can we build up new understandings of interactive networks that are not only uh, multiple uh, at different levels, but also shifting over time, um, coexisting based on different types of interaction, different material resources that are being exchanged, uh, would probably be the most archaeologically visible version of that. Alongside that work, uh, Brian Foyer has asked uh, us to rethink Mycenaean ethnicity, joining John Bennett in thinking about Mycenaean identity as something that is particularly of an elite, uh, that, it, that are forging bonds um, across regions through sharing a material culture. Jason Earle's recent article has looked at uh, exchange from a specifically Cycladic point of view and noted not only the presence of exotica, but its absence. And, and asking why do we have uh, long distance exchange available to the people of the Cyclades at certain points and not others. Uh, and in particular that that access seems to become more available after the fall of the Mycenaean palaces. So those are just some different ways that people are, are starting to, I would say, reframe questions of regional interaction uh, and how it connects to long distance exchange as well as local production. Now, I was asked to think about uh, not just the Bronze Age today, but for a separate project to think about reciprocity as a, a dynamic that brings together exchange within regions and sort of longer distance extra Aegean connections. And in doing that, I was struck that I pretty quickly went back to Halstead's 1992 diagram of uh, Mycenaean economies which uh, was sort of a, a wonderful way of thinking about our evidence for framing the, quote, palatial economy of Mycenaean Greece and, and looking for ways that we could uh, approach that through different kinds of evidence. Of course, the linear B text, archaeological data, and uh, ethnograph ethnographic parallels as well. And it was striking to me to think how this is still really useful, and we still need to work on seeing some of these colored arrows through in terms of applying different kinds of archaeological evidence, uh, in terms of framing um, the way that we read the Linear B tablets with a broader mind and not just being um, sort of committed to that palatial perspective. Also in thinking about that uh, and thinking back to the Heidelberg Conference, uh, I've noticed that one of those divisions within Bronze Age studies, which seems to be nearly as strong as ever, is the division between text and material. And that uh, one of the many great reasons um, Aravantinos was a, a good choice to start this conference off is that he's one of the few scholars that really does work between the Linear B archives and not only where they were found, but the broader archaeological context. Uh, and that's something that I think we should all, try, those of us working on Mycenaean Greece at least, um, should really pay attention to and, and try and reconnect uh, Mycenological studies back into broader debates uh, about archaeology and, uh, and how we build up new models that take advantage of texts but are not dependent exclusively upon them. So enriching that potential are the um, amazing discoveries of Linear B tablets in three new places in recent years. Um, from the material excavated many decades ago in Volos, from a casual find initially at Ayos Vasilios in Laconia, and from the systematic excavations, but unfortunately not in the greatest context, um, at Iklina. These uh, small samples, um, I think it's one, three, and five tablets from these three sites, um, don't have a whole lot of content to offer given their fragmentary state and small numbers, but they're radically important in terms of how we think about record keeping, how we think about central places, um, and I would argue how we think about palace administrations functioning across a region. So the, uh, the Greek headline uh, for Ayos Vasilios was not alone in connecting a handful of fragmentary tablets 
to the status of the site as a new palace. Um, and I think this is something that I hope <coughs> archaeologists working on the mainland will look back at what's happened with Crete over the past two decades or so and, and take caution in terms of what are we expecting for uh, our, our terminology and, and why and what is to be gained in the label of a palace. So as the number of sites on Crete has grown rather dramatically, the number of types of places that are called palace has, of course, um, splintered. And so that we have places of radically different scale uh, and different architectural form and presumably different administrative and, and integrative roles as well that are sharing that title as palace. So I'm going to move very quickly through a couple examples from Eastern Boeotia. <coughs> First of all, just to sort of reposition us in terms of, of Thebes and, and last night, uh, this geography of the region that Vasilis worked out based on the archives at Thebes, which allow us to see um, that there is indeed uh, a connection between Thebes and at least sites of the immediate region so that we can pretty well identify um, from FT 140, not only Thebes, but also Eutresis, and of course what I'm interested in, Eleon. Um, whether or not that purview of the palace or uh, interaction extends to Eubea, as Anthony Snodgrass mentioned yesterday, or further afield, as some have claimed, I'm going to leave that alone for right now and focus on how well we can define this part of the Theban region. So this, of course, relates to my work with the Eastern Boeotia Archaeological Project, which I'm going to give very short shrift to. Um, but I just want to pick out a few examples and, of course, acknowledge the work of my collaborators, Brendan Burke, Susan Lupak, Vasilis Arvantinos, and Alexandra Harami. Uh, we chose this region first for a survey because of the, uh, it was actually an unsurveyed part of Boeotia amongst all the other projects of recent years. Um, and it really seemed to be an important uh, potential zone of interaction between Thebes and the Euboean Gulf. Um, so the site of Eleon is joined by Tanagra, the site of the, the Larnakes, um, as demonstrating clear Mycenaean activity between Thebes and places like Aulis, where Syl and Alex have recently argued for uh, the Mycenaean harbor uh, for Thebes was located and a number of sites uh, around the southern Euboean Gulf that are very important at the end of the Late Bronze Age, especially. Um, so I'm just going to pick out a few things to show you about our excavation work here, uh, for which you need to be oriented by the fact that there's this big late, class, late archaic or classical polygonal wall running along the eastern part of the site, uh, which has always been known. Uh, but never explored through excavation until starting last summer. Uh, from the Mycenaean period, when we know the site was participating in the Theban economy, uh, we have some unexpectedly prestige-like finds in terms of ivory carvings that uh, probably served as appliques for larger objects. The, the piece on the bottom, uh, just a small bit of a rosette frieze, perfectly in line with Mycenaean presumably palatial project products, um, something that might, we might choose to look for, to Thebes as the source of. Uh, but then this little head that we found um, is more interesting and more complex. And this was really sort of our first payoff for thinking about a lay on as along the line between Thebes and not only the Euboean Gulf, but the East Mediterranean. Um, so that this piece, well, I would argue it is a Mycenaean carving because of its flat back and little nail hole for applique to something larger. Uh, it nonetheless shows features that are in line with East Mediterranean style in terms of the physiognomy. Um, so it is some version of an engagement with international styles. In the subsequent 3C period, we have a fantastically well-preserved destruction deposit that um, is great fun because of things like the Kylikes smashed in the, the basin, um, but is really important because of how closely this 3C material 
relates to what's been found at Lefkan D. Seropolis. So that this points us, again, not towards Thebes, but towards a, a locally formed region to the east. Um, and I'll just say that this is part of a larger context where not only do we have the great destruction level, but also uh, several uh, reuses of a hearth. Um, so we're collecting a broad range of material that's going to really allow us to look at um, all kinds of transitions between the 3B and 3C period in terms of local economy. Um, and I just want to show very quickly um, where our, the fact that this is a multi-period site is paying off, again, better than expected. Um, as we're exploring the entrance uh, formed by the polygonal wall, uh, so this is a robbed out tower of the archaic classical wall, where we're, we're now seeing, and we'll see more uh, after this coming summer, um, how this classical construction interacts with Bronze Age remains that are there in blue. Um, so this is what we're hoping turns out to be a big Cyclopean wall, and Vasilis is encouraging us to think about mud brick uh, on top of this for a substantial perimeter wall. Um, but there's no doubt that this rebuilding of the site in the 6th or 5th century is very aware of the Bronze Age heritage here. And specifically at this point where the classical wall hits visible Cyclopean remains, um, there is this platform where we found uh, a, a broad series of small votive type objects. It's especially great because we have no classical material showing up in other parts of the excavation. So it presents uh, an intriguing enigma in terms of why this enormous wall is built and how it is celebrated um, through the deposition of hundreds of miniature cups and dozens of figurines so far. Now, that kind of status that Bronze Age Eleon had, both with different parts of, uh, of the, its contemporary world and with the following historical periods, that's where I think we can really do well to reconsider and redefine local and regional networks uh, anew from the evidence as well as from analytical models. So that we can look in our survey zone surrounding Eleon and notice the, the vast concentration of Mycenaean material only at Eleon and Tanagra, for example. We can see not only that it connects with Thebes from a material and administrative point of view, um, but that that might be a circuit around Thebes which coexists with other Mycenaean era um, administrative units. That in the subsequent period there's a redirection towards the Euboean Gulf uh, and the sort of different network that, like the Cyclades, is enabled to, uh, to thrive more clearly without the presence of palatial oversight. And that this whole region deserves, you know, fresh consideration in terms of what kinds of connection can be made, again, not only in any one given period, but during, uh, across a period of time. So forgive me for talking so much about my, my area and my interests, uh, and I just wanted to end by saying that these, uh, these are questions which I'm pursuing in Boeotia. And again, I really think these could be taken up um, very profitably in other areas. The Sharp Project in the Peloponnese, for example, is really helping to redefine uh, Argive connections. Uh, and that one place that really stands out as deserving and well positioned to take up this kind of work is, of course, East Crete where the NSTEP Study Center has been uh, an institution of its own for the past 15 years, where excavation has thrived at a number of small locations, so that we really have a diversity of places that are available for study and, and a fresh perspective on the interaction between them. Uh, and I just thought I'd end by acknowledging uh, that not all projects are official synergasias of one sort or another, and that, again, a sort of great model of participation, I think, has been the work of Tom Brogan and Phil Betancourt with local authorities uh, at sites like Papadiocambos and Crecy, where, again, these smaller, um, you know, places that have been unexplored for a long, long time uh, are finally turning up really important information for helping us reframe uh, the possibilities of interaction and productive economy across that area. Thank you very much.
good morning, everyone, again. It's, I'm in a weird position of having to present somebody who needs no introduction, <laughs> <laughs> Professor Anthony Snodgrass, who was, of course, the, who held the Lawrence Chair uh, of Classical Archaeology at Cambridge from 1976 uh, to 2001. And I had the privilege to meet uh, Professor Snodgrass last year in, at the Center for Atlantic Studies. I was a fellow there last year, and as you probably know, Professor Snodgrass is a senior fellow there, and he travels twice a, a year to uh, this small Arcadia in the middle of uh, DC. So with no further introduction, please welcome Professor Snodgrass. Thank you very much, Sil. Uh, there's a lot of austerity about in Britain and much more so in Greece at the moment. And this is going to be a very austere paper <laughs> with no uh, visual aids at all, dealing almost entirely in conceptual terms. Listening to Brian and indeed to Vasilis yesterday, I felt strongly envious sentiments because insofar as they have problems in their period, uh, we have them in the same ones in the early Iron Age, plus a gigantic one uh, peculiar to ourselves. On the very broadest of issues, namely how can we begin to agree on an understanding of this period, even in rough outline terms that say every Bronze Age prehistorian would agree on that there is such a thing as pre-palatial, palatial and post-palatial. Uh, we have even no equivalence for that. Long ago I acknowledged the mistake I made in entitling a book The Dark Age of Greece rather than say The Greek Early Iron Age. <laughs> it set up a sitting target, a barn door so big that even the most inept marksman could not <laughs> miss it. As perhaps the following quotation will show, quotes, the images about the time after the breakdown of the Mycenaean palace culture sometimes looked like horror pictures. The palaces were burnt down, the inhabitants were murdered one after the other. <laughs> The land was devastated, the remaining folk driven up into the mountain areas, completely impoverished, to live out a nomadic existence, no longer with a fixed connection to one area, no settlement activity, no buildings, no production, etc. Close quotes. <laughs> this picture is outdated. Sorry, then close quotes. Uh, I love particularly the contrast between the precision of murdered one after the other <laughs> uh, with the vagueness of etc. <laughs> um, I'm not going to name any names, but by some oversight, this author, a highly respected authority in perhaps another field with the, uh, rather than uh, archaeology, by some oversight he left out famine and plague. <laughs> but otherwise this grotesque picture exemplified what I've heard called disaster porn. <laughs> but to eliminate pornography from the study of the early Iron Age is really not enough. I think we'd all gain by trying to discuss the period without the judgmental and emotive language that it has so long attracted. Since, for example, in 1897, Zuntas and Manat called the post-Mycenaean Greeks quotes, but feeble folk, close quotes, for letting themselves be overrun by the Dorians. Next, secondly, I believe we should not expend so much effort on an elusive absolute chronology. We can all presumably agree, unless we are subscribers to the Centuries of Darkness school, that from the later part of LH3C to the appearance of late geometric pottery, about three and a half centuries elapsed. About 12 generations, as long as from the Pilgrim Fathers to Watergate. But much as we would like to insert internal landmarks and divisions within this time, that does not justify 
producing those tables of spuriously accurate dates that the archaeologists have fed to the historians and literary scholars who eagerly gobble them up. <laughs> Let us be content for the moment to acknowledge that there is a long time gap to be filled with something. For one thing, these pseudo-dates do not usually acknowledge the huge factor of regional time lag, which must have operated almost everywhere and all, at every time. Specialists know, for example, that Cretan early protogeometric overlaps with Attic late protogeometric, suggesting a delay of perhaps a century between the two regional styles. But there are much more gross cases on the fringes of the Mycenaean world where primary burials with typical Middle Bronze Age pottery contain also finds of 13th or even 12th century BC date. Further north still, there are even iron objects in primary context with Middle Bronze Age ones in secondary context. It's just one facet of the regional differentiation that is a prime characteristic of the era. Next and thirdly, it is time for us to try as far as is feasible to reduce our dependence on pottery styles. It seems clear to me, as it did to John Papadopoulos some years back, that the capacity of painted pottery to represent internal change, movement of people, chronological divisions, economic stagnation and recovery, has been exploited in early Iron Age studies far beyond its proper limits. There is the easy rejoinder that for some of these purposes we have absolutely no alternative choice other than painted pottery. I question that. A potential alternative much more sensitive and already sometimes widely used is architecture. Another admittedly less sensitive and much less often used one, but with infinitely greater importance in real contemporary terms is metallurgy, the pattern of bronze and iron usage, its quantification, ultimately perhaps its explanation. And here the growing number of good sanctuary publications is a godsend. Yet it is pottery to a degree hardly found outside Greece or indeed outside this period in Greece that has almost obsessively been used to define and label entire cultural phases. When I was teaching the subject and exhorting all students to read Nicholas Coldstream's Geometric Greece, at the same time I did criticize the assumption that the use of geometric pottery was so important as to define two whole centuries of early Greek civilization. I used to warn as a joke that sooner or later somebody would also publish a book called Proto-Geometric Greece, <laughs> only for that to happen more or less in 2002, <laughs> although Irene Lemos's The Proto-Geometric Aegean is very carefully entitled to acknowledge the awkward fact that there simply never was a synchronous phase of proto-geometric pottery use throughout the then Greek world. It is time to free ourselves from narrow applications of ceramic studies and direct our efforts to bigger and more important patterns. None of these bigger factors is as fundamental as depopulation. Not because demography can explain everything else, but because it is such a telling marker of other things. Above all, the long-term loss of that resilience which has characterized throughout history human response to catastrophe. For a long time, this seems not to have happened in Greece. Today, we surely have the tools to take a further step in quantifying post-Mycenaean depopulation. The rise of field survey, which Brown was referring to, on its own has provided the deafening silence of its negative evidence for the rural sector in most parts of Greece. Next, uh, uh, regionalism, 
another very important factor, and the closer attention to geography that that requires. The discoveries of the past 20 years have thrown new light on, indeed almost brought into existence, uh, a major new regional factor, the Mycenaean periphery and its capacity for nurturing survival. One exemplary instance, that of the region of Achaea, had long since been recognized. We can now see it as just part of a semicircular ring surrounding the former Mycenaean heartland. Key features in all of these regions and sites are relative obscurity in the palatial era and remoteness from its leading, remoteness from its leading centers and a contrasting pre prominence of the final post-palatial phase of the Bronze Age, late Helladic 3C. And a persistence, sometimes even later than that, of characteristic features such as chamber tombs or unfamiliarity with iron. Nichoria in Messenia is in some ways an example of this tendency, but for all the low profile that it seems to offer in the palatial heyday, it can't really be classed as remote from it any more than the rest of Messenia in, in which had lain within the kingdom of Pylos. Achaea is a much more characteristic region with a whole array of late Helladic 3C cemeteries and certain of its features are also echoed in the Ionian Islands offshore. Across the Corinthian Gulf to the north, Thermon in Aetolia offers the first example of a regional sanctuary with the requisite signs of independence from the palatial world, even though it is now known to have coexisted with it. But it is in the long neglected regions of the central or northern central mainland, Phocis, Eastern Locris, Theotis and Malis, that real enlightenment has come. Some of this uh, shown already by Brown. Uh, as a result, to an extraordinary degree, of the efforts of one excavator, the Efo Fanrio Vaccaronia, there's no time to spell out the pattern of sites here, uh, concentrated in the plain of Atalandi, but extending far west and north from there, where there, are, there is cist tomb burial throughout the Mycenaean age, but it coexists with chamber tombs, which also reach their climax in late Helladic 3C and survive for longer still, backed also by settlement sites on the promontory of uh, Kinos or the islet of Mitru, and by another great sanctuary site at Kalapodi. Of the burial sites, perhaps the most significant is, significant is Elatea. Its cemeteries have produced over 90 chamber tombs, a classic representative of the region in that the burials of the Mycenaean palatial era are quite overshadowed by the late Helladic 3C component. Traditional burial practices persist, even to the extent of cutting new chamber tombs down to the earlier proto-geometric, and the reuse of older tombs continuing much later still into geometric and occasionally down to Imperial Roman times, as also happened in the Atalandi plain. The graves are full of small bronzes, fibuli, tweezers, knives, trowels, glass and faience finds, and in one instance, boars tusks from a helmet. One of the excavators describes the associated pottery as lavishly decorated, lavishly decorated, <laughs> and the finds as a whole as, quotes, amazing, indeed overwhelming, <laughs> comma, while the same scholar who I quoted at the beginning uh, holds that an affluent society here lasted down to about 980 BC a generalization that <laughs> fails both tests of emotive value judgment and phony chronological <laughs> precision. Now, Elatea is not the most accessible bibliographically of sites, but I have to say that I've yet to find anything in the reports that justifies quite such extravagant words. Uh, for example, boars, tusks 
from helmets have long since been known in 12th century contexts, from Achaea and from Knossos North Cemetery. Rather, Elatia is a prized specimen of a widespread feature of the age, the survivor culture. Profiting by distance from the main targets of destruction in, at the end of LH3b, even possibly to the point of gaining from those disasters. I avoid using the word refuge because I don't think there's any real proof of movement of people into these regions. The overriding element is that of mainstream Bronze Age, indeed sometimes Middle Bronze Age, inheritance. This region was not the future, it was largely to stand aside from the growth of the polis system, and we're often ignorant even of the toponyms here, but from, for the time being it was the present. Now, some of the same characteristics could also be found across the Ubian Gulf in Left Kandi, notably relative obscurity in the palace era, followed by relative predominance in 3C. In the latest excavations of the settlement at Zeropolis, the remains of this phase seem also to overshadow those of the succeeding Iron Age. But of course, it is the finds from the cemeteries which tell the different story. These have drawn our lasting attention, and as a result, I think we'd probably agree that Left Kandi does not actually easily fit into the Phocian, Theotian, Eastern Locrian cultural grouping that we've discussed. It is simply too innovatory, and of course it has its own network. To end with, I make what may appear to be a digression. For a time over a century ago, the whole understanding of early Greek archaeology and art history was distorted by the spectre of Panionism. The case for an Ionian homeland for Homer, which rests, of course, on internal as well as external evidence, the certainty of an Ionian origin for Thales and his successors in early Greek thought, simple geographical factors, all of these combined to spark off a belief in a universal Ionian priority. From its origins in Germany in the 1880s, Panionism pervaded European and North American scholarship, affecting every class of material. Proto-Corinthian pottery, for example, was Ionian. As for sculpture, the doctrine still had to be resisted as late as in Humphrey Payne's archaic marble sculpture from the Acropolis in 1936. Today it's long dead, but instead we seem to be witnessing the growth of a new spectre in a slightly earlier period of the Greek past, pan-Eubianism. <laughs> its origins go back over 50 years to when John Boardman's papers laid the basis for identifying pottery styles as Eubian, the discovery of Lefkandi in the 1960s, and even before that of Pithecusae in the West, almost entirely validated these identifications. By the 1970s, whole conferences were being devoted to the Eubians. In 1980, Oswin Murray's historical survey, Early Greece, devoted its chapter five to them. Mervyn Popham, one of the discoverers of F. Candy, wrote rather combatively of a pro-Eubian faction in the context of a pottery provenance analysis. In 1988, Martin West floated the possibility of a Eubian origin for Homer. During the 1990s, Andrew and Susan Sherratt published a series of articles on the central importance of Mycenaean trade and commerce in this and other areas. I'm sorry, I should have said Mediterranean trade and commerce in this and other eras, a project that received a boost with the publication of Nicholas Purcell and Peregrine Horden's The Corrupting Sea in 2000, with its key emphasis on connectivity. On the Iron Age itself, Purcell was reticent, confining himself to saying that new discoveries enabled us to, 
quote, retroject the beginnings of the period of rapid change and dynamic movements of people, which we'd always associated with the seaborne diasporas of the 8th to 5th centuries BC. Rapid change in the 11th and 9th centuries? <laughs> I'm not so sure. In 2002 came Irene Lemos's The Protogeometric Aegean, a heavily pottery-based study in which, of course, left hand he plays a prominent role. But the real feast day of pan-Eubianism <laughs> came with the publication of Robin Lane Fox's <coughs> Traveling Heroes in 2008. Here there comes a point where even Lane Fox stops to catch his breath uh, <laughs> with these words, quote, so far I have written of Eubians and credited them indiscriminately with important settlements and contacts from Tunisia to the Chalcidian North, from Syria to the Bay of Naples. Were there really enough traveling Eubians to man all these places? <laughs> question mark. Close quotes. He's not alone in asking that last question. Um, listening to Sue at the beginning of this conference, uh, referring to changes of status, colleagues, students becoming colleagues and so on, I thought of an additional category change that can happen. Supervisors of supervisors becoming pupils of their pupils' pupils. <laughs> and this has happened to me recently with uh, a Stanford graduate student, uh, Sarah Murray, a uh, student of Ian Morris's, who's corresponded with me on her thesis topic of foreign imports in protogeometric Greece. She covers a much wider geographical area than Nemos's book. Um, she'd taken pains to confine her coverage to a period ending as far as we can judge around 900 and excluded, for example, all the finds with Cretan proteometric pottery that are likely to fall after that date. In answer to my direct question, she told me that the grand total of her trawl of imported objects was 74, of which 48 were found at Lech Kandy. <laughs> it struck me first that two-thirds is a rather high proportion, but secondly, that 74 is a rather small number for a century and a half, though I must add well above the count of exported objects traveling in the opposite direction. It shows the dependence of the interpretation of an entire period on one single site. Well, to end in a thoroughly un-American way, uh, it will not have escaped some of you that the name of every one of the every one of the last ten names I've mentioned, uh, apart from Sarah Murray, Boardman, Popham, Murray, West, the Sherrits, Purcell, and now Horden <laughs> to Lamos and Lane Fox. What do they have in common? <laughs> they all work or worked for the same university, Oxford. <laughs> now, <coughs> justified, uh, justifiable pride in the discovery of Left Candy has, in my view, been aggrandized into something a bit more tendentious. And notwithstanding the fact that it was my own university of training, for a whole branch of study to have one university, one site, and to a large extent one class of material so completely dictate its interpretation cannot be healthy. <laughs> Thank you very much. tweet your last quote, <laughs> and we're done. Um, it gives me great pleasure uh, to invite our next speaker. Let me introduce uh, Kathleen Lynch to you. Kathleen is an associate professor at Cincinnati University. Um, she has worked extensively on sites in Italy, Greece, Albania, Turkey. Uh, she's currently working on the publication of material, ceramic material from Troy, Gordion, and the Athenian Agora. I will focus on her best virtue as a, as a scholar, which is that she has the ability to, on one hand, focus on ceramic assemblages, but then 
put them in a wider context and talk about people and social pro processes. And that is very evident in her wonderfully written book, uh, The Symposium in Context, Pottery from a Late Archaic House near the Athenian Agora, which also won the 2013 AIA James R. Wiseman Award. Please uh, help me welcome Kathleen. so much, Fotini, and thank you to the organizers of this conference, which is uh, impressive and, and insightful, and certainly it will be, we will all go away learning new things, that's for sure. It is an absolute honor to be invited to speak here. My assignment today is to talk about the present and future of classical Greek archaeology, but to do that, I feel that we have to talk about the past to understand how we came to where we are, which will, in turn, determine where we are going. This is a daunting assignment, first of all because classical archaeology is a term that has many chronological and geographical boundaries depending on who is using the term and in what context. For our purposes, I take classical archaeology to mean the study of archaeological remains found in modern Greece dating to the period from the Archaic to the coming of the Romans. Second. This assignment is daunting because when I saw in the preliminary program that I was to follow Professor Snodgrass, mm -hmm. I had a small heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> but this was also an inspiration because Professor Sm Snodgrass himself had addressed this very same subject some 25 years ago in his 1985, 1987 book, An Archaeology of Greece, The Present State and Future Scope of a Discipline which captured the Sather lectures he had given at the University of California at Berkeley in 1984 to 1985. And I thank Jack Davis for suggesting that I go back to that publication and Professor Snodgrass's predictions as I consider my own remarks. I will divide my talk into three sections, classical archaeology in American academia, intellectual trends in classical archaeology, and classical archaeology in practice. Like, like others here, I will generalize and be provocative in order to stimulate discussion. And as, as far as Jack's uh, help with this paper goes, as, they, as we say in our prefaces, all mistakes are my own. Don't blame him for anything I say. <laughs> so let me first address the role of classics in academic departments, a subject that Professor Snodgrass also assessed in his lectures. I will confine myself to the American university system because that is what I know best, but I encourage those of you from Greek and British academies to comment on developments affecting your own institutions and your own research during the discussion. In the US, as it was when Professor Snodgrass wrote, classical archaeology is still practiced within art history. My own doctorate comes from such a program, but the connection with traditional art history is more tenuous now. Positions for art historical classical archaeologists are dimish, diminishing as art history departments use the retirement of classical scholars to replace them with non-Western or theoretical disciplines. These are perceived to be new interests. There remains, as there were, was in the 1980s, a grave distance between classical archaeology and what archaeology departments, or what North American archaeologists do. In these latter fields, the emphasis on quantification and theory orients them more with social sciences than humanities. Archaeologists studying the Cahokia, for example, readily apply to the National Science Foundation or even NASA for grants, while classical archaeologists ra rarely do. I don't see this as changing in the future, despite the pressure from university administrations to seek more outside funding. Classical archaeology does, however, continue to graft anthropological methods and theory onto classical archaeological questions with great success. Everything from burial theory to identity and ethnicity had its birth or childhood in anthro, yet class classical archaeology is rarely taught in anthro departments. 
What has not changed is that classical archaeology is still very much a province of classics departments. However, the line between philologist, historian, and archaeologist is increasingly blurred. And our colleagues require less persuasion that material culture should be considered alongside literary evidence. For evidence of this, we can use the same metric that Professor Snodgrass used in his book, the increasing number of interdisciplinary scholars appointed to Berkeley Sather le le lectureship, including the great historian of religion, Robert Parker, who is the lecture this year. From an institutional point of view, I don't see classical archaeology moving out of classics departments. However, there is room for classical archaeology to make a bigger mark. Enrollments in Latin and Greek at many, at many, but not all, U US universities continues to drop. But if we look at the job advertisements for the past two years, the data that is easily readable, re available on the APA placement service website, even though it is impressionistic, the majority of ads, 75%, seek primarily a language teacher, and the largest subgroup are ads that seek language teachers who have the ability to teach, quote, classical civilization or classical culture type courses. This add-on is a telling phrase for only 12% of the jobs actually ask for language instruction plus the ability to teach, quote, archaeology or, quote, material culture. For departments authorizing ads, classical civilization likely means Latin and Greek texts in translation, or worse, it reflects the assumption that any philologist worth their weight can handle the material culture. What I find interesting about this continued dominance of philology is its conflict with or disavowal of two important trends in higher education, general education and active learning. The job ads continue to stock departments with language teachers who are teaching smaller and smaller classes of, say, fourth year Greek with two students, taught in a traditional manner, while classical archaeologists can teach large enrollment, non-major classes with a component of active learning or self-discovery. The ideal of small classes and low instructor to student ratios went out the window with budget cuts at many institutions. If, my, if I may be so bold, I feel that this employment trend perpetuates an outmoded style of education, and frankly, one that is unsustainable to many university administrators. It is also out of touch with the needs and expectations of today's undergraduates, and it stifles the ability of classical archaeology to contribute to pedagogical advances. Classical archaeology continues to take a back seat to language instruction, but it can be a backseat driver. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, we have at our, at our disposal a considerable variety of resources that beg to be dis exploited through interdisciplinary digital humanities projects, either for training or teaching. Here, classical archaeology can be a leader, not a follower, and I will return to this idea in a few moments. Turning to intellectual trends, as Professor Snodgrass predicted, science and archaeology are closer than ever, but there is still room to grow. We will hear more about this this afternoon. Classical archaeology has been much slower to integrate scientific studies, although most projects now at least have someone on call for floral, faunal, and soil studies. Although uh, excavations of prehistoric sites are much more likely to have dedicated zooarchaeologists on staff than historical sites, and this is a shame because the extensive textual and material record provides a rich context for scientific research, whether it is petrography or micromorphology, which will continue to expand its contribution to classical archaeology. There are likely new techniques on the horizon, such as for dating and analyzing material composition. However, as these techniques become more and more sophisticated, it will be necessary to rely even more on collaboration among specialists to interpret results. Again, considering the job ads, in the past two years, there has been only one job for an archaeological scientist, Mac Marston, who's in the room right now, <laughs> <laughs> who has a, a wonderful position at Boston University. I suppose, as long as you can teach Latin, a specialty in archaeological science might count as ability to teach classical civilization. <laughs> Among other intellectual trends, 
post-processual theory still has its grips on the field of classical archaeology. I wish I could declare identity dead. <laughs> Today is my birthday, and if there were a gift that you could give me is to promise me you will back off from identity. <laughs> However, <laughs> at a glance, the American Anthropological Association's 2012 conference program, it demonstrates that identity is alive and well. And I do not mean that identity is not a good lens through which to view the ancient world, but it is feeling overworked. The trend, like others such as ethnicity, hybridity, and individual determinism, arise from the complex modern society in which we inhabit, for good or bad. We, wi we risk in reducing our focus so narrowly that we lose the ability to make general generalizations and predictions. Again, borrowing from other fields, classical archaeology is discovering the utility of computer modeling. We've already seen this from Brian. Right now, a hot topic is network theory, measuring connectedness to explain relations among sites, cultures, and peoples. While some of this can be done by hand, comu computer models allow extrapolation from actual data to a reconstruction of what might, might have been the case. In addition, the application of GIS, another technique borrowed this time from geography, has allowed us to see patterns in data <coughs> that would take a lifetime to recognize by hand and remote sensing literally adds new dimensions and cost savings to site exploration. One caution about these rigorous objective analyses, we cannot lose sight of the fact that our data sets are inherently subjective despite these seemingly objective treatments. So with all of this in mind, what has classical archaeology contributed to other fields and how can it lead into the future? Classical archaeology with its diverse, rich, long-term data sets and unparalleled written record has provided a model for establishing contexts for interpretation of material culture in the ancient world. This holistic view offers many opportunities for the future, especially with the application of digital humanities projects. Only in classical ar archaeology can you get the combination of fine and coarse res resolution to a picture that allows you to scale up or down to fit the, op the question at hand. For example, we can see a multitude of different political systems in operation and evaluate their strengths and weaknesses historically. But at the same time, we can also give voice to individual citizens of the Athenian democracy. The flexibility inherent in the variety of the evidence needs to be exploited even further and used to test ideas at such as agency or even devolution of power. Here, I think we even have something to offer to modern policymakers. Considering how we do classical archaeology, as we just heard, both excavation and survey continue to be practiced. And the big dig is still alive, despite reports of its demise. <laughs> but its goals have changed. Large-scale excavations have better defined research questions, and they must contribute more obviously and seriously to host e economies and cultures. In fact, the resources of large excavations, Delphi, Olympia, the Athenian Agora, for example, could be better directed to make them leaders in the field for archaeological practices, ranging from excavation techniques and recording to study of the finds and preservation of excavation archives. Archaeology is no stranger to politics and nationalism, and the more respect excavations show to their host countries, the better the outlook will be. Beyond big digs, Archaeological projects are increasingly difficult to mount financially, and permits are increasingly competitive, if not restricted. So I feel, as Professor Snodgrass did, that the future of archaeological discovery lies in what he called the Apatheke Mountain. Perhaps now we should call it the Apatheke Mountain Range. <laughs> and here I cheat. This is from Gordion. This is not from the <laughs> modern Greece, but it's the, the most uh, dramatic that I could find. We have corrected this now. More, if you'd like to know more about that, ask me at lunch. There are several lifetimes of excavated material longing for study. The big digs are as guilty as smaller, even salvage excavations. I'm a pottery specialist, and from what I can tell, entire sites are apparently aceramic based on the absence of pottery and 
publications. <laughs> we need to instill in our students that excavation is not the only way to answer important questions about the past. Primary study or reconsideration of previously excavated evidence, what we are calling legacy data, is just as valuable. Yes, it can come with challenges, but so do uh, freshly excavated data. It is irresponsible to continue to dig when so much dug by our elders remains unpublished. I do realize that funding agencies don't find study seasons or restudy of old materials sexy, and we need to do more to educate them. When the funding picture turns, so will the interest in giving older material its due. Classical archaeology remains the queen of interdisciplinarity, which now includes archaeological science along with philology, history, and material culture, and therein lies its future. So it's long un unresolved questions. What is the meaning of the Parthenon frieze, for example, are likely to be answered through collaborative, multidisciplinary projects. On the other hand, it has the depth of evidence to evolve with contemporary approaches and questions. Classical archaeology provides a laboratory for testing ideas as diverse as the fundamental importance of humanities to the success of societies, to the pluses and minuses of tyrants and what happens when they are overthrown. We are also poised to explore basic unanswered questions. What did people eat? How did they farm? How did cities govern? But classical archaeology does not stop with the what's or how's. It can answer the more important why did they questions. And that is because of the tapestry of evidence that provides a context for finds as well as ancient people. I may have focused heavily on the big picture perspective of classical what, what classical archaeology has to offer. But in fact, in order to establish these contexts, we need solid research on topics like the chronology for pottery types outside of Athens, or the design choices the architects make. And I also feel like I have overstated the ability to answer questions. And that is what is wonderful about archaeology. We can offer an answer, but each generation with new finds, tools, and ideas can reassess and offer its answers. <coughs> archaeology is a protein field, but I think that's what draws us to it. So as I was, con I was pondering my conclusion, I turned once again to Professor Snodgrass's book and found that the last sentence still holds true. He said 25 years ago, quote, these suggestions have in common the purpose of advocating a modest degree of change, whereby a perhaps uniquely conservative discipline could modify and extend its field without sacrificing the true strengths that have kept it alive hitherto. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure um, to meet, to uh, introduce now uh, Stavros uh, Vizos, a uh, friend and colleague that I met in 2002 uh, in Athens for the first time. Um, Stavros Vizos is, of course, the assistant director of the Benaki uh, Museum in Athens and a lecturer at uh, the Ionian uh, University in uh, Corfu. Um, he currently is a uh, director of the Amicleas uh, Archaeological Project in the Peloponnese, and he's also a scientific um, a member of the uh, Athens uh, Roman uh, Seminar. So uh, please welcome uh, Stavros Vizos. Uh, allow me first to thank the organizers, and especially Sue, for inviting me to be here <coughs> to share thoughts <coughs> on Roman archaeology, although after this <coughs> hymn on classical archaeology yeah. from <laughs> Kathleen and this uh, 
precious thoughts on methodology from Bronze Age and uh, Iron Age. I would say just add Roman period and that's it. I'm not necessary, <laughs> not any more necessary. Um, but uh, maybe there is one, one big question or uh, one problem with Roman archaeology in Greece, uh, that is uh, recognition. Uh, it's um, compared to the other um, uh, fields in classical archaeology, it's the newest one, I would say, which was uh, recognized in Greece, especially. So, dear colleagues, uh, dear all, at the beginning of my talk, allow me to express a personal view on the present and future of Greek archaeology on, on the Roman period. I believe that its evolution is strongly associated <coughs> with the Roman seminar, an uh, initiative established in 2012 by five scholars from five different institutions, each representing the antiquity service, academic environments, as well as the current landscape in Greek museums, of Greek museums. This presentation uh, focuses on three major issues that characterize Greek archaeology of the Roman period. First, the discussion on Greek and Roman art in the period when archaeology was established as an academic discipline, the late 18th and early 19th century. Second, politics and the formation of ethnic identity, identity, Kathleen. <laughs> and third, the so-called new archaeology. Concerning, uh, concerning the first issue, in uh, 1837, Alexandros Rangavis, a pioneer archaeologist in Greece and member of the newly founded Archaeological Society in Athens, stated in the first volume of the Archaeologie Ephemeris, the first Greek scientific journal on archaeology, that from the time Roman power forged the Greek nation, uh, art lost immediately its virgin elegance and initial grace, wore the arrogant pomp of the conquerors, <laughs> and handicapped irreverence the holy monuments of the ancient glory in order to impose the character of servile flattery. <laughs> this statement was uh, clearly affected by the 18th, late 18th century discourse between Johann Joachim Winkelmann and Giovanni Battista Piranesi on the preeminence of Greek over Roman art, and by the political circumstances, especially by the political circumstances in his newborn country, Greece. Twenty years later, in 1857, uh, this phase of discussion, let's say, about the meaning of the Roman past in Greece was concluded by George Finlay and his book, Greece Under the Romans. Throughout the coming years, the urge of continuity from, class from Cycladic to classical art then moving through Byzantine to modern Greece was essential to the formulation of the Greek national identity in the late 19th and uh, 20th century. Analyzing the topic uh, archaeology and Hellenic identity 1896 to 2004, Dimitris Blanzos clarified that when it comes to archaeology, constructions of identity have influenced the meanings of pasts. The ideological premise underlying the modern narrative of Greek archaeology excluded the Roman period, which was, uh, together with the Ottoman, Ottoman era, simply occupation. This was the context and meaning that characterized all the scientific works and excavations in Greece, organized and run by the Archaeological Society in Athens and the State Archaeological Service, with the support of the Archaeological Department of the University of Athens especially, from the 19th to until from the 19th century until the 1980s so roman layers were just stripped off in the last 30 years archaeology has drastically changed changed as noted by mark mazo especially and today there are surely less identity issues between the needs of political power and archaeological profession the rise of uh, heritage industry in greece has improved the protection also of Roman sites and monuments. Rescue archaeology, on the other hand, has led in the last decade to an increase in material that in long term will enrich enormously our understanding of Roman Greece. More importantly though, thanks to the work of uh, numerous scholars from the 90s uh, onwards, the Greek archaeology of Roman times has started to be recognized. 
and start being recognized. Furthermore, the spread of field surveys, <coughs> ethno-social archaeology, Roman provincial archaeology, and the boom in, mu in museology have diffused the discipline's offerings and led to a better conception of the specific past today. We have to come to understand the attempt to bring this other Roman past into the picture and to fill the gap of the historical narrative. Within Greece, the scholarship has, has changed too. <coughs> when the discussion about it through publications, conferences, and lectures was carried out in Greek. As for the first point of my talk, the new archaeology and the Roman past in Greece, uh, <coughs> Uh, an attempt to set the agenda for new deployment of archaeology is not any more necessary, I would say. It is clear that the theoretical background of the archaeology, of the, also of the Roman past in Greece, has been established already within the classical archaeology. Paul Zanka, Andrew Wallace Hedrill, Anthony Spofforth, especially Sue Alcox, Gretchen Kapta, introduced and established this different approach social and economic developments, drawing on a combination of archaeological and historical sources, archaeological evidence, in particular the new data provided by archaeological surface survey, and the, news of new, the use of new technologies especially emphasized. <coughs> Focusing on aerial photography, ter terrestrial and airborne laser scanning, and other dynamic topics, Several publications and projects in Greece remind us of the value of studying landscape functions as a link between landscape and identity, especially in the Peloponnese, less in Macedonia, Thrace, and the Aegean, and over a long-term span till late antiquity. James Wiseman and Konstantinos uh, Zachos applied these concepts in the formulation and uh, conduct of the Nicopolis project. Uh, here, an undertaking in landscape archaeology focused on the human societies that inhabited southern Epirus in northwestern Greece from earliest times to the medieval period. Still an ongoing project within this framework is the Action Victory Monument and the definition of visual rhetoric and the creation of a dynast dynastic narrative at the Triumphal Frieze. Settlements remain, settlement remains, sanctuaries, cemeteries, political and trade relations, relationships with other centers, including Roman times, is the subject of the landscape project of uh, Georgia Kokorua Levras from the University of Athens, called The Role of Demos in the Ancient World, the case of Alasarna on Kos. Since 2004, the Sigion project by Yanis Lolos of the University of Thessaly is a fully in integrated multidisciplinary research project program to study the human presence and activity on the plateau of ancient Sikion in northeastern Peloponnese throughout time, focusing, of course, on the Hellenistic city. Patterns in regional activity in Messenia and uh, southwest, uh, the southwest corner of the Greek Peloponnese, from the geometric to the end of the late Roman period, are explored in the framework of the Pilos Regional Archaeological Project, especially the publication Part 7 in 2005. The Eastern Corinthians Archaeological Survey investigated from 1997 to 2003 the region east of the ancient city of Corinth, shedding some light also on its Roman past. The Kenkrai Cemetery Project between 2002 and 2006 has illuminated, illuminated funerary ritual and its relationship to social structure at the eastern port of Corinth during the early imperial period. In terms of including the Roman past in landscape archaeology in Greece, the German Archaeological Institute in Athens takes uh, intensive part with three projects. First, the road network Olympia, with focus on uh, road and communication links in northwestern Peloponnese. Uh, second, the topography of Trifilia, 
where settlement history and the relationship between polis and chora uh, and small and of small extra urban sanctuaries with Olympia are studied. And third, the Kalapodi uh, project in Theotis, Central Greece, which investigates, investigates continuity and change in a Greek sanctuary from the 14th century BC to the late Roman period. Finally, <coughs> Emery Farinetti's uh, PhD project at the University of Leiden was focused on a GIS-based ana spatial analysis on the long-term settlement maps from the province of Boeotia, central Greece, from prehistory to modern times. In terms of a topographical lexicon, the Academy of Athens published in 2012 volume J35 of the Tabula Imperi Romani concerning Smyrna, Izmir, and uh, the Aegean Islands. Let's shift um, at uh, this point uh, to major excavation and research project at Roman sites, uh, with the Roman sites. But uh, at this point, uh, allow me to remind you that uh, the State Archaeological Service uh, in Greece undertakes rescue excavations with the remains, of course, of uh, the Roman period throughout Greece, everywhere. But the main projects are the following. Ongoing works, contextualization, and uh, interdisciplinary approaches are the main focuses in Athens at the so-called Library of Hadrian and the Roman Agora. In Corinth, of course, the Acropolis of Sparta, ancient Messidi, the villa and cemetery environment in Nicopolis, Epirus, in Macedonia at Dion, uh, Thessaloniki with the Galerius Palace Complex, and uh, sporadically in Filippo, Philippi, uh, and then especially in Crete at Gortina, focusing on the large-scale Roman theater. We cannot uh, properly understand history without a full appreciation of the spaces through which its actors moved and the ways in which they thought about their worlds. A serious gap in the interpretation of private houses in Roman Greece is filled by the book of Paolo Bonini, La Casa nella Grecia Romana, from 2006. Here just a sample of few publications. In his recently published dissertation, Evangelos Michaelidis from uh, the University of Thessaloniki demonstrates the different ways in which spatial analysis on the subject Agora can illuminate our understanding of Greek and Roman society and the ways in which these societies thought of and interacted with the spaces they occupied and created. A similar approach is evident in the dissertation of Valentina Di Napoli from the University of Athens on the sculpted decoration of the theaters in Greece during the Roman time, uh, currently in print. Multiplicity of meanings that statues might have held for the people who experienced them, power relations between the elite and non-elite, the no longer particularly re relevant sharp distinction between native and Roman, are just few topics presented in the volume on, on uh, classical tradition and innovative elements in sculpture of Roman Greece, published in 2012 by Stefanidou Tiveriou. For me, it is extremely important that this book <coughs> provides a comprehensive study on new material from all the areas of modern Greece uh, in context. The existence of local tradition alongside Greek and Roman elements <coughs> in their religious content and artistic significance, and the phenomenon of Romanization in the provinces of Thracia and Macedonia are demonstrated in two studies. Maria Deudi on the Thracian Huntress, Roman monuments uh, from uh, Macedonia and Thracia and, uh, in 2010, and in 2012, Kalliopi Hadzinikolaou, again from the University of Thessaloniki, on the presentation of gods and heroes in Upper Macedonia. Complementing the Corpus Ignorum Imperi Romani, the Academy of Athens again published three volumes relating uh, to, related to material in the Heraklion Museum in Crete in uh, 1998 and 2002, and the Athens Acropolis Museum in 2004. 
two studies are giving us a good, a good example of how the multiple citizenships are a sign of the breadth of social and cultural relations entertained by notables and the, the close relations between the polis and the imperial age Greece. The first one, uh, Schmaltz, Augustan and Julio Claudio in Athens, a new epigraphy and prosopography, 2009, and uh, Anne Heller and uh, Anne Valérie Pont, Valérie Pont on the multiple citizenship in the Greek uh, world of Roman times in 2012. Prosopography in combination with material culture in the provinces Achaia and Macedonia are very much represented <laughs> through the work of the Institute for Greek and Roman Antiquity of the National Hellenic Research Foundation. Volume 63 of the Meletimata, edited by Athanasios Rizakis in 2010, is devoted to Roman Peloponnese, society, economy, and culture under the Roman Empire. Highly productive in examining the Roman past in Greece on the ground of epigraphical sources is Francesco Camilla, who at the same institution and as volume 65 in Meletimata published his book on Theoi Sebastoi, Il culto degli imperatori romani in Grecia in 2011. Real insights into the development of the society by comparing and synthesizing the data from all fields are produced on the ground of new material, specifically related to Roman Athens this time, in the book Athens, du Athens during uh, the Roman period from 2008. This volume summarizes the results of research, based, uh, um, of research based on the discoveries during the recent excavations uh, for the construction of the Athens Metro, the New Acropolis Museum, and the unification of archaeological sites of the city of Athens. A similar, similar approach can be traced in the publication of 2012 from Roman to early Christian Thessaloniki. Last but not least, conferences and exhibitions are important for provoking the interest about the Roman past in Greece. Regarding conferences, I would like to underline shortly the following, starting with uh, Susan Walker and Cameron's The Greek Renaissance on the Roman in the Roman Empire in London in 1986, Pavo Castrin's post Athens in 1994, Michael Hoff's and uh, Susan Rotschow's The Romanization of Athens in 1996, myself in, uh, with Athens during the Roman period in 2006, and uh, the most recent one, Stefanidou Tiveriou, Classical Tradition and Innovative Elements in Sculpture of Roman Greece in Thessaloniki in 2010. Concerning exhibition, I would like to stress the key role of the new galleries at the Athens National Archaeological Museum that was inaugurated in 1995, having both material and catalogue presented in chronological order for better understanding especially art and art evolution. A totally different perception was adopted by Thessaloniki's Archaeological Museum, where material obeys to thematically meanings, thus in my point of view, losing sense of timeline. A good combination of both temporal and uh, thematic organization of the material can be found at the new, small, but wonderful archaeological museum in Nicopolis. On the contrary, Patras, a city with equal importance in Roman time, obtained a new, mu a new museum in 2008, but uh, still struggling to find its meaning. It is a common topos, dear colleagues, that culture operates on a contextualized and indistinct basis with no bounded categories of pre-selected matters. Therefore, I conclude that uh, putting the emphasis on, on interpretation of archaeological material and small-scale specific survey project will provide the solid ground for <coughs> examining the landscape during Roman times in Greece which undergone a complex process of reshaping by its uh, inhabitants. Consequently, it's time to start revisiting, re-examining the rhetoric of the romanization of Greece, emphasizing on the elements uh, of the material culture that constructed this new hybrid identity. Similarly, 
the focus of the Roman seminar lies in investigating the various developments th uh, brought about by the Roman conquest in the polis and their territories on a local, regional, and provincial level through the intensive study of archaeological and written sources. Investiga investigation of uh, such matters, uh, I think, will be more helpful than claiming exuberantly, for example, that uh, the second sophistics uh, legacy is the identity and creation of the modern Greek state, as expressed in the book Perceptions of uh, the Second Sophistic and Its Time in 2011. Regarding this phenomenon, there is no need to emphasize on Roman Greece as an extraordinary phenomenon, but rather to incorporate to incorporate this story equally in the narrative and the conceptual framework of the Greek past. As pointed out at the beginning of this presentation, time has come from, for Greek archaeology, especially for Greek archaeology, to redefine its relationship with the past and especially with the Roman era. Thank you. I am not Bill Carraher. <laughs> Unfortunately, Bill could not be with us, but he has very kindly uh, sent us his uh, paper. He's also following us right now on Twitter. Um, so uh, allow me to tell you a little bit about Bill. Uh, Bill Carraher is an assistant professor at the Department of History at the University of North Dakota. Uh, he did his PhD in the, at the Ohio State University and his dissertation was about early Christian ritual and architecture. Uh, Bill has participated and directed uh, numerous projects in Greece and Cyprus. Uh, he's the co-director of Pila Kutsopetria Archaeological Projects in Cyprus, and more recently associated with the Eastern Corinthian Archaeological <laughs> Survey. Uh, I should mention here that Bill has also a very influential blog called The Archaeology of the Mediterranean World. Um, with topics that range from uh, punk archaeology and music to uh, the archaeology of the Mediterranean. Now, uh, now please allow me a, a small personal comment before I, I start reading Bill's paper. Uh, as a Byzantine archaeologist myself, I always assumed that uh, problems with um, the centrality of a certain region of the domination of uh, text and so on was always a problem in Byzantine archaeology. And I'm happy to find myself today with so many people that deal with similar problems. I've never been uh, felt so much of uh, within a community of archaeologists as I felt this morning. So thanks to our morning speakers for that. So back to Bill. The field of Byzantine archaeology in Greece is both longstanding and slow moving. It is fair to say that many of the issues of interest to the earliest Byzantinists in Greece persist and save the conversations that scholars of the Byzantine period have today. <coughs> Our interest in chronology, architecture, land tenure, and in the interaction between the Byzantine provinces and a core constituted by the leading cities of Constantinople and Thessaloniki remain topics of active debate in much the same terms as they were a century ago. The favorite topics of archaeological investigation for the Byzantine remain searches, fortifications, and imported ceramics, the pretty stuff as we call them, which are studiously placed in typologies based upon plan, architectural uh, style, shape, and decoration. This work has revealed the tremendous richness of Byzantine Greece and created a substantial, if fragmented, corpus of archaeological data available to contemporary scholars and begging for new approaches to provide new context. Over the past 40 years, then, most Byzantine archaeologists have grounded their knowledge of the period in formal and stylistic analysis rather than more scientific or conceptually robust interpretive frameworks. In general, they have turned a skeptical eye towards processualism and have studiously ignored post-processualism. On the other hand, 
Since the 1970s, a small cadre of Byzantine archaeologists have called for the field to become more deeply engaged in the methodological and theoretical uh, debates current in both Mediterranean and world archaeology. John Rossers and Tim Gregory's calls to arms in the 70s championed the potential of regional level and inte intensive pedestrian survey to expand their knowledge of the Byzantine countryside and to bring archaeology to questions relevant to larger issues of Byzantine land tenure, rural settlement, and trade. <coughs> Cecile Stryker's and Peter Cunningholm's use of dendrochronology to date Byzantine churches represented an effort at scientific dating. Charles Williams' uh, stratigraphic excavations at Corinth, and Nick Ardulias and Timothy Gregory's use of intensive survey and remote sensing to document the fortress at Ismia and deserted islands, complemented work done in the countryside by the various uh, second wave survey projects to produce an increasingly sophisticated body of archaeological data prepared as a foundation then for new perspectives on the Byzantine period in Greece. Unfortunately, to, to date, relatively little of this work has come to impact the master narrative of Byzantine history or to find its way into larger discussions of Byzantine archaeology, which remains dominated by standing architecture, complete vessels, fortifications, and the result of a handful of urban or monastic excavations. In recent times, however, there are signs of change. There is a growing interest by the various foreign schools in Athens and at Dampartanox to draw together and reinvigorate scholars interested in the archaeology of the Byzantine period. This has begun to yield some results as junior scholars in the field, both from the US and Europe, have found opportunities to develop their research at the turn of the 21st century within institutions that embody the long-term preservation of specialist knowledge. Obviously, I'm a good example of this as well. This has complemented recent work on the late Roman and Byzantine period in the environs of Corinth, at the Agora in Athens, Messini, Sparta, Nemea, and in various valleys and regions subjected to intensive survey. Another upshot of this institutional support is a growing sense of awareness and common cause among Byzantine archaeologists, and this has led, in at least one instance, to the collection of articles on the recent developments in theory and method in the field. These articles engage topics ranging from gender and ethnicity to spatial analysis at multiple scales, intensive survey practices, house and household assemblages, and digital methods. In short, the article suggests that Byzantine archaeology has come to embrace larger trends in the disciplines of archaeology and history. My paper today will now try to summarize the range of current research into Byzantine archaeology. In fact, the volume I'm editing with my colleague Kostis Kourelis does not succeed at that in many more words than I have here, but instead I'll offer my own ideas of where the field should go and refer readers to the volume when it comes out for a more expansive view. The study of architecture has long stood at the core of Byzantine archaeology in Greece. The main focus, of course, has been on churches, ranging from the almost innumerable early Christian basilicas dotting the countryside to the elegant ranging um, centrally planned churches of Byzantine urban areas. Liturgy, chronology, decorative programs, and to some extent issues of construction frame most of the discussions about Byzantine architecture in Greece. Less well-known work has touched upon medieval housing, fortifications, craft organization, and urbanism more broadly. In recent decades, this work, as well as recent works on early Christian architecture, has seen a shift from studies of buildings as discrete units within complex typologies or as vehicles for the decoration to an approach more engaged with how these build buildings functioned in society. The study of early Christian architecture, for example, has come to consider the role of the church uh, in the rise of Christianity in Greece. The buildings have gone from marking out the distribution of Christian communities and the extent of a particular, if poorly understood, Christian liturgy, to being active participants in the conversation of communities in Greece. At present, the lack of a secure chronology for most of these buildings remains vexing and limits the kind of arguments we can make uh, based on architecture alone, but it's clear that we're on the verge of discussions of agency in early Christian architecture. Considerations of ag agency resonate with similar wide-ranging range, con conversations about agency 
in study of material culture more broadly. The architectural use of spolia in late Roman and Byzantine Greece remains the focus of significant research. We can argue, of course, that a particular interest in spolia by the first generation of Mediterranean archaeologists had extraordinary destructive results as they dismantled <coughs> Byzantine monuments in their search of ancient inscriptions and, and sculpture. In recent times, however, the study of spolia has shifted from documenting ancient blocks in later buildings to the study of buildings like the tiny little metropolis at Athens as part of a larger uh, cultural dialogue. Amy Papalexandro's seminal dissertation on the spolia riddled Panayat Skripu has transformed the way that we think about ancient spolia in Greece and has positioned Byzantine archaeology at a key juncture in the history of the reception of antiquity. A recent dissertation uh, of the use of spolia in the late Roman walls at Sparta, Aegina, and Isthmia locates this practice at the intersection of the aesthetics and performance. It is hard not to imagine the study of wall painting, mosaic, and other decorative traditions of the Byzantine period to follow. Much remains to be done, however. For example, it's remarkable that no scholar has systematically studied the use of early Christian or even earlier Byzantine material in Byzantine churches, overlooking a key indicator of a historical and architectural relationship between Byzantine Greece and its early Christian predecessor. Understanding the performative aspects of the Byzantine buildings, both at, as the sites of ritual and the products of broadly construed ritual practices, requires that we become more attuned to the evidence for how these buildings functioned over the course of their existence. Rigorous excavation practices that go beyond the production of floor and face plans can reveal more about Byzantine buildings as living architecture um, susceptible to myriad small decisions and eventualities rather than uh, punctuated shifts in style. Bob Oosterhout's important uh, book in 1999 on the master builders of Byzantium has set the stage for such a discussion. The rest of the discussion will have to come from the careful reassessment of both excavated buildings and new architectural studies that manifest as much attention on the process of building and construction as the final product. The prospect of sorting through material excavated decades earlier in search of the imperfect and elusive evidence for performance or construction practices rarely excites the ambitious field archaeologists. The limitations of data, data collected for purposes far removed from contemporary concerns or as the byproducts of the long studied practices of digging through the biz, has made the prospect of studying the Byzantine levels as excavated sites appear rather bleak. At the same time, recent work by Betsy Robertson, for example, on no less problematic building as the Roman period uh, by Pirini Fountain at Corinth, reminds us that monuments excavated long ago can still disclose, disclose important insights into the histories. Costis Kurelis has begun to scratch the surface of Byzantine remains from Corinth by going carefully through past notes books. Similar works at Olympia holds forth some potential for re revealing the basic structure of the fortified Byzantine settlement at that site. Attention to the late phases and burials in the Roman period bath at Ismia and at the site of Messini will provide important evidence for the later settlements and households um, at these ritual sites. The continued refinement of our chronology of Byzantine pottery, thanks to publications of material from Argos, Athens, Sparta, Corinth, and elsewhere, holds the potential to unlock Byzantine archaeology trapped in the chronological interstices of earlier work. The same attention to so-called legacy data can extend to survey projects across the Mediterranean. At the moment, the last of the great second wave survey projects are publishing their Byzantine material with the exciting recent works of Ionita Vroom in Biosia and the soon-to-be-realized publication of Effie Athanasopoulos uh, for the Nemea Valley. It is perhaps an opportune time to return to the data collected from off-site scatters published less thoroughly in earlier survey publications and dated by means of less robust chronologies. Of particular significance is the growing access to digital tools 
ranging from relational databases to re relatively user-friendly GIS uh, that introduces new ways to analyze and present decades of, a of all distributional data. As a brief example, Bill uh, re-examines the survey data from Thisbe <coughs> Basin in Boeotia collected over the course by Tim Gregory's Ohio Boeotia expedition in the late 70s. Preparing a GIS map of that basin, constructed largely from information gathered from the project's notebook, allowed Bill to compare here the patterns of late Roman material around Thisbe with the recently published material from the, neighbor, uh, the, neighbor, the neighboring polis of Thespius. The parallels between the two distributions reinforced the bimodal nature of late Roman settlements with nucleated sites and possible rural villas as the most common concentrations of activity. To maximize the impact of new technologies and new approaches, we need, of course, to ensure that archaeological data from the Byzantine period becomes widely accessible to scholars looking to ask new questions and deploy new methods of analysis. While work done to ensure that raw archaeological data is accessible is hardly as ro romantic or professionally <coughs> rewarding as excavation, Byzantine archaeology has much to gain by studying overlooked material from both excavations and surveys and bringing it into the develop developing discussions of settlement, architecture, and chronology. The future of Byzantine archaeology in Greece must extend beyond the renewed scru scrutiny of buildings and the rigorous study of material from known sites and regions and engage an approach that seeks to understand Byzantine time and space beyond the limits of a single site, monument, region. Landscape approaches, for example, offer inclusive ways to understand the dynamism of Byzantine culture in a unified interpretive space. Byzantine writers themselves constructed landscapes rich with meaning in their texts. Local high geography, in particular, demonstrated an awareness not only of standing monuments, but of abandoned place and ruins. The indigenous archaeology of Byzantium influenced site formation, uh, embedded the experiences of saintly excavators um, among both pagan sites and earlier churches, and reinscribed their landscapes with monuments from the past. The lived landscapes produced by Byzantine saints serve as a useful reminder to contemporary archaeologists that Byzantine sites are more than just dots on the map, but part of a lived landscape of settlements, shrines, monuments, paths, and natural landmarks. St. Nicholas rebuilt churches, Agios Theodoros and Agia Theoctisti lived in their ruins, Agios Ioannis the Stranger identified and reappropriated several abandoned Greek buildings in the Cretan countryside. More recent, uh, more recent archaeologists have shared this interest in understanding the character of ancient landscapes. Significant work has come from archaeologists interested in actualizing the experience of prehistoric landscape, hinting at the potential in Byzantine archaeology, where texts are poised to fortify the experience of monuments. Even if we acknowledge that a field like Byzantine archaeology, which remains ambivalent toward the so-called new archaeology, is unlikely to pivot abruptly <coughs> to embrace post-processual practices, it is hard to ignore that pot the potential of the robust intersection of text, regional survey data, monuments, and the growing body of research in Byzantine urbanism. Attempting to produce an integrated perspective on the Byzantine landscape extends beyond the studious plotting of Byzantine settlements, the redating of Byzantine monuments, or the mapping of Byzantine trading routes. We can see the leading edge of the new Byzantine landscape in, for example, Mirtoveikus' recent work on Byzantine Epirus, which evoked third, places, third spaces to unpack the relationship between monuments and settlements. Archie Dunn's reflections on the location of resources around the Boeotian site of Thisbe. Heather Grossman's intriguing observations on the movement of spolia and some recent works on routes and paths from medieval and later Cyprus. As their saintly predecessors, Byzantine archaeologists of the 21st century should look towards producing dynamic landscapes, which begin to integrate the fragmentary windows in the Byzantine past into more cohesive holes. By producing new Byzantine landscapes, we can not, all, not only begin to address larger questions concerning the organization of Byzantine time and space, but also create new relationships that open new lines of inquiry. Thank you. <laughs>